Let's talk to somebody now who was also at the conference as a speaker, who is Ralph Schulhammer. You know him well here on Talk TV. He's a political theorist and, uh, uh, and of course, uh, based at Vienna University. Uh, good afternoon to you, Ralph. To see you, Julia. I Thanks. was actually hoping you would uh, introduce me as a far-right firebrand. Far-right uh, firebrand. Well, do? we're all far-right now, apparently. I mean, if you're not, if you're not basically, if you're not, if you're not Owen Jones, you're all far right now. No, you've been, you've been at this conference as well. Have you already spoken, or are you due to speak? I spoke yesterday. Mm -hmm. So uh, kudos to the organisers. I think they really had to carry quite the burden that uh, ultimately they were capable of going through with the event. But uh, just to add on to your conversation that you had before, right? I think we have to realise that it's the obligation of the state to protect those who want to speak and not to protect those who want to prevent others yes. from speaking. But this is the direction in which we are going. And just as a real quick point also for your viewers, this is the direction in which all these ideas of hate speech laws like in Scotland or uh, uh, democracy enhancement laws in Germany. So we have all these fancy names uh, with anti-disinformation campaigns or anti-disinformation rules for Facebook for, for, yeah. for all the, the social media platforms. This is the direction in which they want to go. There is a part of the population all over the West right, that those who are in power want to exclude from the public debate. So this yeah. yesterday was an isolated incident, if you want. But you could also say it was a dry run for the things they plan in the years to come, because I think all over Europe, all over the United States, there is a sense of trepidation and fear within the leading elites in the media, in politics and anywhere else, that there is, a, at least at the voting booth, an uprising of the people afoot. And now they say, if we can just undermine their way to communicate, if we can kind of get them shut out from the public debates, then maybe we can also defeat them in elections. But yeah. these are then, of course, not really true and fair elections anymore. No, I mean, indeed, and it is fascinating. I mean, people might liken this to, to the, what people call, and Donald Trump certainly calls, a witch hunt, witch hunt against him. You know, if he's so awful, defeat him at the, the ballot box, many people would say. But this is the fascinating thing. I, it has never occurred to me, and I'm sure never occurred to you, that I need to have people who disagree with me, who are pushing forward other ideas, whether they are just simply, you know, I don't know, middle of the road ideas. You know, we're talking about the smoking ban uh, today or, 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 or discipline in school schools or, or an economic policy or something horrific and far right and, and, and racist and something you and I would never agree with. Um, I would never feel the need to have that shut down because I know that I can argue and debate that and I can defeat those bad ideas with my good ideas and let people make the choice. And we saw that with it's famously Nick Griffin, the leader of the BNP, uh, it, it, genuinely a far right party um, in, in this country, being invited on question time. Big hoo-ha, like, oh, you shouldn't like give these people a platform. And I'd always argued they should be given a platform. And I worked in a local paper in East End of London when the BNP had their first elected council. I always said, no, give them a platform because you expose them to daylight and and uh, and and people are being able to hear what they actually say hear their arguments and what a surprise support for that party collapsed afterwards as it always does when these people come to light um tell me the sort of um tell me the sort of thing that people were saying on stage at the conference on i say it's third venue as each one was basically talked out of hosting this event what was what you know what did you say what did you know uh, Miriam Cates or, or, or sorry, Suella Braverman had to say, what did Nigel Farage have to say that was so awful and dangerous that it needed to be shut down? I think it was usually what I would consider a mainstream position. Some of them I agree with, some of them uh, I might disagree with, but the main topic, of course, was uh, migration, right? Another topic was whether or not Europe and the European Union are the same thing. And I think there's growing agreement, at least on the political right, that you can love Europe, but you can reject the European Union. Um, there was the matter of energy, right? As we always talk about, there was the matter of farming and there was kind of the general matter of if the direction in which Europe, including the United Kingdom, if I may, is going at the moment. And it's not a good direction. I mean, we see this if you look at uh, the polls, what's going to happen in the elections in Britain. Most people in Britain are not happy with the political system. Yeah. Most Europeans are not happy with the political system. In an ironic way, I think the general population of continental Europe and the United Kingdom have never been as unified as now in their dissatisfaction satisfaction with the powers that are. And the frustrating thing is there was a lot of comparison. Oh, this is like in the Soviet Union, like this is like in fascism. But it's more insidious because in fascism and Soviet in the Soviet Union, you knew you were living under a totalitarian regime. But what happened yesterday in Belgium was they are not saying we're shutting you down, we ban you from speaking, right? They say, well, we would allow you to speak, but it's really a hassle with public order. Yeah. And you can go to the courts and you can find another venue. So they don't just say you can't do it. They just create conditions where they make more and more and more obstacles in the hopes of those who want to speak to throw in the towel and say, is it all worth it? 
And yeah. this is, I think, what people must understand, that, that the kind of tyranny developing in the West is a capricious one, right? It, it's one that is not coming with, you know, uh, brown shirts and, and you know, jack boots. It's coming in, in a way yeah. that it makes your life more miserable. Yeah. Uh, what I like to say, they don't go for the body, they go straight for the soul. And I think this is a major issue. Yeah, absolutely. And look, we've seen this in, uh, in British universities, and I'm sure we've seen it, I mean, certainly in American universities, so it's shutting down I mean, really prominent, you know, thoughtful speakers to, about to talking about you know, trans ideology and the impact on women, uh, talking about why critical race theory is actually, you know, it's not anti-racism, it's just another form of racism. People talking about things, people going, no, no, there might be trouble, we're not allowing this event to go ahead. Or some people in the room might not like what you say, it might be triggered and might not be able to cope with it. I mean, these are absurd ideas that, um, I mean, certainly, you know, when I was younger at university, no one would ever thought of this. But we see this with our media as well, the attempts to shut down, um, you know, people who, who say things that people don't like, whether it's Nigel Farage or GP News or or me or or, or whether it's, uh, uh, you know, attempts to sort of just, you know, I suppose censor what could be heard, censor who the guests are on TV. There was a whole campaign to stop me being invited on BBC shows because people didn't like what I had to say. I mean, like, you're not supposed to like what every guest has to say. It's, I mean, it would never, ever occur to me to say someone I disagreed with, even if I thought they were genuinely a bad person, that they should be censored from speaking. And yet this is common, not just on the far left, but on the moderate left, and even, I would say, among centre right as well. This sort of, you know, you're far right, I'm far right, we're all, we're all terrible, heinous people for saying stuff which, as you and I know, is actually mainstream opinion. Right. Yeah, no, I think you're absolutely right. And what you said is very true, very important. It is no longer an interest in finding the better solution. So if you want to use the high mighty term of finding truth, the question is always, how do you make someone feel? And then, yeah. of course, all bets are off. Because if I say, or you might say, Ralph, you're a bold guy. <laughs> and maybe that makes me feel bad. So I say, well, Julia should be banished from speaking because she's insulting me. Right? It doesn't even matter that what you say is correct. What matters is that it might hurt my feelings. And you I could, you could identify, you could identify as a man with with a full head of hair if you wanted. Apparently, that's what we're allowed to do now. Identify as what why, we want. Why are you assuming? Why are you assuming that I identify as a man? That is very presumptuous <laughs> of you. <laughs> but this, but this thing, this is the nonsense that we've got into, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, this is there, there was always a certain. I always say this is particularly true for the British. There's always a certain tolerance for the eccentric, but we always knew that it was eccentric and therefore yes. limited to the fringes of society. But now we have kind of the fringes and the eccentricities kind of taking over the center. And now in many ways, I would also argue, particularly about the younger generation, many want to be identified as eccentric. I think, for example, oh, yeah. what we talked also at the conference, what you see happening is that I think it was 25% of, of Gen Zers or under 25 year olds identify as anything but a heterosexual. No, that's ridiculous. We know yeah. that's a social contagion. That's a, that's a fashion thing. You want to be seen as special. Uh, and there, of course, you know, we kind of lose a little bit grip of reality because yeah. what's real is not as important as, you know, how you feel about things or how you can present yeah. yourself. And Absolutely. I think that's, that's, that's not good. Absolutely. I mean, it's fascinating. What do you think the reaction should be to this? We know, you know, when it comes to this conference, the, the, the conference is supposed to go on for a few more days. And they're looking for another venue uh, and carrying on. That we need to stand firm on these issues and, and, and make sure that, that these sort of events can go ahead and that people get to talk and get to meet. And we need to make sure that even when it is someone who is saying something that we really disagree with and we really disapprove of even, that we should stand firm. And I thought, think back to, you know, gosh, way back when we're talking decades ago, when the, uh, you know, the, the uh, ACLU in America, the Association of Civil Liberties, um, you know, um, no, no, advance, advance the colored people in civil liberties, generally, they, they actually campaigned, um, did they not, was it, was it them, but campaigned for, to allow a Nazi rally to go through a Jewish area because they said they still had the freedom of speech and actually, when you when you try and shut down events and shut down freedom of speech, you know it's actually it tends to be minorities that that tend to actually end up being the the bigger victims in the long run. It's in all of our interest to protect everybody's freedom of speech. 
Oh, yeah, and, and as you as mentioned out, and I think let's have the debate. What is so unnerving very often, and I'm sure this happens to you as well, is it is very hard to find people, and that is also, by the way, partially true on the right, so I'm not just accusing the left of this, is to have a debate, to go on shows yeah. like yours or somebody else and say, okay, let's hash out the argument. Yeah. Uh, it might get a little bit heated. I mean, you notice yourself, like you have been part of this very often. It gets a little heated, but at least then you have both sides of the argument and the people are smart enough to decide. But this idea too, I don't even want to hear what you have to say. Yeah. I think that's, a, that's it's also, by the way, a boring trend. Yeah. It, it's kind of, oh, people yeah. want public and but, they can handle it. But it's not just I don't want to hear it, it's I don't want anyone else to hear it. Part of that That's to me point. is not right. just about, you know, people being sort of authoritarian. They're also, they're also contemptuous of voters. Go back to Brexit. People didn't know what they were voting for. They were conned by the Russian bots, by lies on the side of a bus. Um, by the way, um, NHS gets more than £350 million extra a week now, so not a lie. Um, and anyway, it wasn't a promise. It was, we could. Um, but um, they, they were conned by Donald Trump. Uh, they, they were conned. Everyone's been conned all along. Whenever people, you know, conned by Boris Johnson, whenever people vote for the so-called populist option, I've never understood why that's considered an insult, something being popular, appealing to what people actually want. Then they've just been called. This is the general view that we, the voters, we're just a bit too stupid, we're a bit too gullible, and let's face it, a bit too nasty and bigoted and racist as well. Don't forget that. Um, and that's why we will vote for horrible people if we're allowed to hear what they have to say. People, supposedly Democrats, like a mayor of Brussels, actually contemptuous of democracy. And that's that's uh, to be very clear, because this is the new talking uh, line on the left. Whenever they talk about defending democracy, be aware of what they mean. They mean defending democracy from the likes of you and me and, yeah. and people who speak similarly like, like we do. That's what they mean, because you you hit the nail on the head. Ultimately, what they think is that democracy is too precious to leave it to the will of the voters. So in order to defend <laughs> democracy, we have to, to abolish democracy. And as I said, you might be on the, not you, but somebody might be on the political left and say, oh, those national conservatives, why should they speak? But the thing is, you say that now, but tomorrow it might be your speech that's going to be banned. So I think this is a dangerous development. And as I always say, the left does one thing very cleverly, by the way, and this is something where they have to pick up. They use terms that make it hard to disagree, right? For example, they talk about the European Court of Human Rights. It has human rights in its title. How can it be anybody against this? Yeah. They say they're anti-fascists. Well, how can it be against anti-fascists? That would make you a fascist. So they're really good in using those terms. So I think it's important also for us we want to reclaim that territory, to kind of reclaim the, the verbiage that is being used because they do this better than we do.